Hey guys, today we're going to be looking at question 957 on lead code, prison cells after end days. So right off the bat, you see that this question has a, um, a pretty bad upvote to downvote ratio. Um, usually questions that have a bad ratio like that, they are either worded uh, in a confusing or poor way, or there's a test case that's out of whack, throwing things off and you'll get a lot of complaints there. But with this question, there's really none of that going on. It's more so that the solution you have to apply is a little bit unintuitive and obscure. You can't just apply a cookie cutter, BFS, DFS, etc., um, and get the answer. You kind of have to be a little creative and make one key observation about this question uh, to, to get the answer. So yeah, the aim of this video is to walk you through my thought process that I use to solve this question and hopefully lift some of the fog surrounding this question. Anyway, uh, let's dive into it and read the problem statement. So there are eight prison cells in a row, and each cell is either occupied or vacant. Each day, whether the cell is occupied or vacant changes according to the following rules. If a cell has two adjacent neighbors that are both occupied or both vacant, then the cell becomes occupied, and otherwise it becomes vacant. So that's your rule set right there. Uh, note that because the prison is a row, the first and last cells in the row can't have two adjacent neighbors. Okay, And we describe the current state of the prison in the following way. Cells at i is going to be 1 if the i cell is occupied, otherwise cells at i is 0. So we have 1 denoting occupied, 0 denoting vacant. Now the question is what they want. Uh, given the initial state of the prison, return the state of the prison after n days. Okay, so uh, let's just do a quick example here. So they give you this initial configuration of the prison, and they want to know what it looks like after seven days. So that's the output. How do they get that? Well, you just apply the rules, right? So, for example, this second uh, cell here, in the next state, it's a one because both of its neighbors, the left and right neighbor, are both the same thing. They're both vacant, right? So that's why that one is vacant in the next state. Just going back up to the rules. And a different example here, uh, this cell, right? Why is it a zero coming from day coming from the first day? Day zero, sorry, that's kind of confusing. Um, it's because if you look above, this cell's neighbors its left neighbor and right neighbor are not the same, right? You have an occupied one here and a vacant one here. So they're different, it becomes vacant. Anyway, so this logic continues uh, through the rest of the days and you get your end result on day seven. So you return this as a nice little list and there's your answer, All right? Seems like a pretty straightforward question so far. You're probably thinking, okay, why is this so confusing? You can just simulate however many days they're looking for, apply the rules, keep updating the state of the prison, and return what you get at the end. The issue comes from, yeah, an example like this, example two, and, and where, where they give you n is, yeah, 10 to the nine. They, they say that down here that in the details, the n parameter that they give you um, can go up to a maximum of 10 to the nine. So if you try to simulate, you know, 10 to the nine days, you're gonna time out, you're gonna get a TLE. Um, you can't do that. Theoretically it'll work, right? Like that's the, the naive brute force solution. and in in theory it works, but when you go to run it, you're going to time out. So how do you solve it then? Right? Um, the key assumption, well there's actually two key assumptions, right? First thing you have to notice is that there are only eight cells uh, in each prison state and each individual cell can either be zero or one. There's two possibilities. So we have two possibilities on eight items. So there are a, there, there are two to the eight 256 possible configurations of a prison state. So there's a finite amount of states. And also, um, realization number two is that each state only depends on the one prior. Right? Day seven is only going to depend on day six. It doesn't care about anything else before. So if you combine those two pieces of knowledge, one being uh, there's a finite amount of states, and each state only depends on the one prior, you can combine those um, to derive that this thing is going to wind up in a cycle at some point. It has to, right? It can't just go on um, randomly and sporadically through 
10 to the 9 days, it's going to follow a pattern. That pattern is going to be a cycle. It's going to fall into a cycle and it's never going to get out. Okay. Um, so, yeah, that's the key observation you have to make. So, okay, how do you implement that in code? Well, to start, I'm actually going to um, develop the initial framework we're going to use. And that, that's just going to be the brute force solution. We're going we're to start with there and then we're going to augment that code into something that implements the cycle idea so that we can actually successfully solve this. Okay, so I'm going to do the brute force one first. Um, okay, we're going to set up a variable called cur, which is going to just track our current state of the cells. Um, and then we're just going to iterate through as many days as we need. And in each iteration, we have to uh, apply the logic, apply the rules, right, to determine what's going to happen in the next state, our state transition. So we initialize a new state, and we're just going to make that a an empty slate of zeros. So just eight zeros in a row. And we're going to iterate through all the cells in the prior state. Right, and we, we don't address the 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 first and the last element of the prior state because like it says here in the note it can't like there, there's there's not this the, these ones don't have sorry these ones don't have two neighbors right this one at the end only has one neighbor and the first cell only has one neighbor so they're always going to be vacant in every successive state the only way you can ever have a one in either of these slots is on the initial um, cell configuration anyway so we only have the process starting at the second one and going up to the second last so that's the reason for for this range here. Yeah. If cur at i minus one is equal to cur at i plus one, then new at i is going to be one. It's occupied, right? And otherwise, it's going to stay as a zero. Like if if this otherwise it becomes vacant, we don't actually have to apply anything in an else statement or anything because it's already starting as a zero. So if it doesn't become if it doesn't match this condition, yeah, it's going to stay vacant. So we're good to go. And then we just finish this off by saying uh, we update the cells. So her is going to become new. And then at the end, we just spit out what we get after iterating those end days. So we return her. I think I hit everything there. So if we go to run this, we run it on example one. Yeah, we get the right answer because n is only seven. It's easy to do that. But as you can imagine, if we were to run it on 10 to the 9, if we were to change this to 10 to the 9, yeah, it would time out. We can't do that. So we have to implement that cycle logic. Okay, so how do we do that? First, we're gonna have to we're gonna need to add some more variables here. We're gonna need to record every single state we've seen, just in a, like a, a record, just in a list, one by one, every single state we've seen in order. And we're also gonna need a hash map that can take us from a given state to which position we saw it in, right? And the advantage of storing that in the hash map is we can we can check if we've seen a state in constant time. Like if we can we can say if this key is in the map, then we're in a cycle, right? Okay, so to get started with that, let's let's make our let's first make our list just recording everything kind of in a ledger. We're going to call it history, and it is just going to be. It's just going to be a list, but we can actually start off the first element as curve because that's the first one. We know it already. And then, oh yeah, something important for, for our hash map here is if we're hashing the state um, as the key, we can't just use a list as the key because in Python, lists are mutable, and we need to use some sort of immutable data type uh, as the key. So that means we could either use a string, or in this case, actually, I'm going to use a tuple. So let's first get our first uh, our first key. It's going to be a tuple of cur. That's just going to transform the list into a tuple of the same length, same entries and everything, except now it's immutable, so we're safe to hash it. And we initialize a hash map. I'm going to call it location. And the first entry of that is going to map key to zero. So that just means that the, the tuple version of our input we first saw it at state zero, and we're going to continue to update this as we go and build both the, the history list and the location hash map. Okay, so now where in this loop do we implement the 
cycle detection logic, how we handle that. Okay, so this part still stays the same. We still have to update our new state, but now we have to update our key as well. So it's gonna be a tuple of new. And now we need to check if it is, if we've seen this key before. So we have this new tuple and we gotta go, okay, is this a brand new one that's unseen to us or is it somewhere in what we've seen before? And if it is, we, conclude, can, we can conclude, sorry, that we're in a cycle. So we do that by checking if key is in location. And if it is, we're gonna do stuff um, and we'll actually be able to return our answer right then and there. We can cut the simulation short. I'll handle the else part first. That's probably easier to start with. So if the key's not in location, right, then we just proceed business as usual. We just have to update our data structures. So history is going to have new appended to it, right? History is, is recording these states in a list representation and location is recording these states in tuple representation. A little confusing, kind of a bit of a nuance there. Anyway, um, and then we get the update location at key is K. So then the, the first place we saw this brand new, um, this brand new key is at location K. So I'm just gonna silence that. My apologies. Okay. Um, so now now now's the hard part, right? We have to implement what's what how to process what happens when we've seen the key before. So the first thing we can extract is the cycle length. Um, I'll just write out the code first and explain it. So cycle length is just gonna be an integer variable and it is going to be equal to k minus the location of this, the first time we saw this key, right? So if we're on day four and we first saw this key on day one, then we know the cycle length is gonna be four minus one, which is three because it went from uh, the state we saw on day one to the one on day two to one on day three and then we're in a cycle so it's going to keep doing that one two three one two three one two three the cycle length is key or is key the cycle length is three sorry so there's the first part we can extract the cycle length and then given that we're actually ready to return our answer and it's going to be it's going to be some index of this history list right we just have to pull out the right index um so we return history at something right now what's that something that's the million dollar question right we're going to break it up into two parts actually the first part is the index of history where the cycle begins and then the second part is going to be which um, index of that cycle um, to return and that that should get us the right answer so the first part of that is it's going to be that kind of that initial offset so to speak so that's just going to be at location key. The first place we saw this thing, that's where the cycle begins. All right. And then that second part is going to be which, which part of that cycle um, is, is the end state, the one, where, the one at the end of the n days, where is it going to end up? Which index of that cycle? So that's going to be, we can use modular arithmetic. We go n minus k, that's how many spots we have left. The remaining number of days left in our simulation that we we need to compute, and we can just mod that by the cycle length, right? So there's where the cycle begins, and that's how far into the cycle we're going to be at the end of the end days, right? Remaining steps mod the cycle length, and honestly, I think that is it. I think all the logic we need is there. We still keep this return cur at the end because. Right, there's a chance we're never going to hit a cycle. For example, in this n equals seven, I don't think we hit a cycle at any point. So, like this for loop is going to elapse. We're not going to. We're never going to hit this return line. So we still need this return curve at the end of the simulation. Or I keep saying simulation, but you know what I mean. If if this for loop ends and we don't hit anything, we still need a return statement at the end just to be safe. Um, and this should work. So right. So this this whole cycle detection thing is a a big circuit breaker. Right? It's a big shortcut. It, it cuts the simulation way short. We're never going to dive into millions and millions of days. We're going to hit a cycle very, very, very quickly. Um, right? Because if there's if there's 256 possible states, and each one only depends on the one prior, we can conclude that the, the maximum length of the cycle, in theory, would be 256. So you're never going to have to, you're, you're, you don't have to go far into this 
10 to the 9 at all until you hit a cycle. So it's, it's going to get cut short um, way before we're even close to TLEing, exceeding our time limit. Um, and yeah, then we get our answer right then and there. We cut it short. All right, let's just hit run code, see if it passed the test case, see if I forgot anything. Looks good to me. Um, and let's just hit submit, see how we do. There we go. So we've solved it. We did it in pretty good time complexity. Um, I don't even know how you would express the time complexity for this solution. Like, I, I guess you could say it's constant time because it doesn't really scale linearly with n. Uh, it's capped at that 256 plus some constant, however long it takes to get into a cycle. Um, Anyway, yeah, so I hope this video was helpful. I hope it helped, you know, at least one of you out there. Um, let me know in the comments if you have any questions about this problem or um, the solution I used to answer the question. Um, anyway, yeah, thanks for watching. Happy coding. Hope you're all staying safe out there. And yeah, bye.